Hey everyone, welcome back to episode 23 of Home Cooking with Food Lad. Can you believe that? I just, the time's gone so quickly. It's been a lot of fun. And, um, you know, it's just, as I think of all the dishes I think we've done, it's been a lot, it's been a really interesting progression. And I hope you guys have had uh, fun with me. And I, I hope that you guys all made the Texas chili last week. I, I had, I had over the course of the couple of days, I made it in a million different ways. And it's just, just totally kind of like comforting and just like, it's like a hug. Um, you know, this this class, you know, we talked about um, really starting to think about the holiday season. And so I thought it'd be fun to start working on sides, right? So we have this class and then we take a week off and then we have another class and then boom, it's right into Thanksgiving. So um, I thought we would lead into really cool dishes that you can do for Thanksgiving. And if you've done versions of these, you can maybe try these. And if this is new to you, um, I think it's just, I think it's really just nice and just kind of hits the spot, these dishes. And so um, we're gonna be working with Okinawan sweet potato, which is something that's totally local to us. Um, and then we're gonna be working with Brussels sprouts, which is a very popular item these days, and it's uh, totally fits for Thanksgiving. So we'll get this all going. Um, and for starters, we're gonna get some bacon, bacon cut up. And this is apple smoked bacon that I'm using. And, I, and I'm cho choosing the thick cut because I want it to be nice and meaty when I'm, when I'm working with it. So I, I'm, you know, I'm calling for about a quarter pound. You can eyeball it. And if you really like bacon, you put more. But we're gonna go ahead and dice this up real quick. Quickly, just gonna cut it in half. Then we're gonna cut it down the middle. Cut it down the middle again. One thing, you know, if you, if you don't have bacon, you can use other things too, right? Pipi kala would be kind of cool. Smoked meat would be really cool. So, and it is really kind of like, kind of fatty. Um, pork is great. Um, that's gonna add a flavor, smoky, you know, ham works. I like bacon because there's a nice fat that comes out of there and it really helps with the cooking. And I'm using, again, this is apple wood smoke, okay? And so when you're making a dish like this, uh, you the thicker cut bacon works and, you know, for the first holiday season, splurge a little bit on the, on the thicker cut and a more premium bacon because it's gonna really make a difference in the, in the flavor that you impart into the dish. So we'll get this in the pan. I've got a, a 14 inch um, Teflon coated pan that I've been preheating. We're gonna go ahead and put the bacon in. And we're gonna let the we're gonna let the fat render out. And this fat is what we're gonna use to cook the Brussels sprouts in. Now, if you are not doing animal products, then you can totally use. We have some uh, someone's talking to us. Um, if you uh, don't want to do meat, that's fine too. So you can use olive oil. Um, or a, a coconut oil, something that's an, another source of fat to cook your Brussels sprouts in. Now that we have our bacon going, I'm gonna start with the Brussels sprouts. I already cleaned some of them, but I wanna show you quickly how to clean them. So I cut off the, uh, the, see the difference? These are the ones that I haven't cleaned is what I cleaned. So I'm just cutting the stem off to get to the clean tender parts. And some of the leaves, some of the outer leaves are gonna fall off, which is what you want to see. This is pretty tough and it's dirty, okay? Now, there's lots of ways you can do Brussels sprouts to cook them. You can cook them whole. You can like blanch them in water to cook them whole. You can roast them, but they take longer to do. And then when you serve them, they're big round little cabbages that you're gonna have to cut with your knife. So we're gonna take these and we're gonna slice them so that they're easier to cook. They cook faster and they're gonna be easier to serve. So basically we're gonna take our Brussels sprouts and then we're gonna slice them. Here's the stem side. I'm just gonna cut them into uh, somewhere between a little, like a quarter inch, a little bit more than a quarter inch. And these are what we're gonna just go ahead and saute. And I'm not going, I want them to be dry like this because it's good. Again, we've talked about water being the enemy of caramelization, right? And I wanna caramelize these so that they get more flavor. Let's take a look at the bacon real quick. You can see all the fat starting to come out. Oops. 
So we're gonna let that cook slowly so that fat can render out and lightly crisp up the bacon. Okay. Come back and we'll finish cutting this Brussels sauce up. So anyway, I was saying that I'm gonna cook these dry because I want them to caramelize and I want them to get nice flavor. You can blanch them and shock them. Uh, it's just that we're gonna, if you're gonna saute them, then you're gonna have to like really let them kind of dry out to get some of that moisture off so that you can get some caramelization on them. That said, you don't have to do that. You could just also just go ahead and reheat them after you blanch them and just butter them with salt, pepper, throw some herbs, and that also works too. Now, one thing about uh, these dishes that I'm showing you too, the nice thing about them is they, they reheat well. So, you know, when you're thinking about Thanksgiving strategy, one of the things I think people do a lot is they try to do everything fresh on the day of Thanksgiving. They wake up at two in the morning and then by the time lunch or dinner happens, you know, your guests arrive and you're just a total mess. So when you think about Thanksgiving preparation, you really want to see as much as you can get done ahead. Now, if you want to do this fresh, I would have diced all of this already and we had that ready. I would have all my uh, Brussels sprouts pre-sliced and ready. But if you really wanted to take it further and really be safe, you could technically make the dish that I'm going to show you and refrigerate it. And because of the kind of, it's a very hearty vegetable, you could totally just reheat it, throw some fresh herbs on there, and it's perfectly great. Everyone's going to be excited. And then you're not, you're not stressing out, slaving in the kitchen, sweating while everyone's, you know, having a good time. So here we have our Brussels sprouts. And we're going to go ahead and cook them now. Now, you see all this fat that's coming out? That's what I'm looking for. I like, I want that fat, okay? I want to cook it a little bit more. I want this, now it's up to you. Your preference on the bacon doneness is really your call. Um, I want my bacon a little bit crisper, so I'm going to let it cook a little bit longer. But, you know, if you want it, if you like your bacon softer, this would be perfectly fine. I'm just going to let this go a little bit longer. And you folks are a very quiet crowd today. Are there any questions? No questions? Uh, it's, it changes. I think right now, because Brussels sprouts are popular, um, I'll make them. But I think that the things, the common denominators for me for Thanksgiving are butter, marshmallows, bacon, ham, uh, all that rich stuff. That's what to me Thanksgiving is about. I'll use it many, many, many different ways. Um, and then the vegetables change up. So you can see the bacon is crisping and I'm gonna start taking it out. If and you're making it. this with smoked meat, do you need to add oil? It depends on the smoked meat. Like if you're using smoked meat that someone made from belly, you, you probably don't need to, but if it looks kind of lean, you, you might have to. Um, and, and to that point, if, it, if you're using smoked meat and it looks lean, you might not have to do what I just did, which is, you know, I'm running this to crisp this up, but I also, what I'm looking, what I'm trying to do is get the fat out because I want the fat. Now, if your smoked meat is a little bit lean, you might have to go ahead and add a little bit of oil to kind of get the process going. So now you see this fat, I'm leaving it in. And then we're going to put, this now it's smoking. This is going to go right in. And again, I don't want to overcrowd the pan, right? You overcrowd the pan, you drop the heat too quickly, and then you don't get caramelization. So I'm making a thin layer of Brussels sprouts right on top of the pan, okay? I'm going to go ahead and season a little bit now with salt, a little bit of pepper. And we're going to start to let this cook, cook, cook and do its thing. I have the my, my heat is on very high right now, and I'm going to watch this. I may have to adjust a little bit but we'll see how it goes from there, okay? So salt, pepper, you got your oil in there. And notice I made a thin layer here and I haven't tossed it or turned it because I want 
the vegetables to brown. If I start moving the pan quickly, it never gets a chance to brown. Now that it's done a little bit, let's see what happens. See, see now you're starting to get that color, right? Keone, if you don't use all the grease uh, for this, can you store th store it for later use? Absolutely, yeah. What you can do is uh, put in a, you know, strain it so that you get the impar impurities out or the little particles out, and you can cover it and put it in the refrigerator and use it. When I when I go on an occasional bacon binge, that's what I do. So what I have here now, next to my Brussels sprouts, these are the sweet potatoes. And I started them cooking because I wanted them to be well on their way when we started class because it's just, it's just taking, it's just gonna be, it's not very exciting to watch these things cook. Can you tell us how you choose the best Brussels sprouts and is it better to get it when it's on the branch? Yeah, um, the, the ones on the branch are cool, right? Uh, we don't typically sell those on the branch, but you can get them, uh, you know, the, 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 the the idea is that if they're on the branch, they're fresher. But if you're buying them by the pound, you're paying, paying for the branch, right, by the pound. Um, but, you know, when you're looking for Brussels sprouts, the ones that I showed you that we started with tonight were really tight and they're really bright green. You don't want it to be yellow. If they're starting to turn yellow on the outside, that means they're starting to get old. You don't want, like, bug spots in them. You don't want a lot of black spots on the outside of them. And you don't want them to be bolted. What I mean by bolted is, when you hold when you hold a Brussels sprout, it should be tight. When you cut into it, you see how compact it is because it's young. Something like this is starting to bolt. You see how it's starting to push out and it's starting to it wants to bloom into and turn into a stem. So that's what you ideally want: tight, compact um, Brussels sprouts. And then again, you know, in Hawaii, I think has to do a little bit with our, you know, our, our Asian culture and Asian background. We like our vegetables typically a little bit more al dente or crisp than European countries. You know, so you can decide what doneness or what crunchiness you want on your Brussels sprouts. But I'm just gonna let, I'm gonna, I turned my heat down by the way, it was on high and I'm starting to get this browning. So I've turned it down to like a medium because I want to kind of like gradually caramelize and cook. If I keep it on high, it would start to burn. But this is the color I'm looking for. This golden color, this brown, that's gonna give you, it's all the sugar that's in the Brussels sprouts is starting to caramelize and it's giving me more flavor. It's gonna give me great um, depth. It's gonna give me umami. If I had these wet, like I had talked about, um, I would not have this kind of, I wouldn't be able to get quite as much caramelization because all that water would be you would be fighting with the water to get flavor. Okay. We have that going well. Now uh, the potatoes. I'm going to show you. This is a this is a Okinawan sweet potato. I want to show you real quick. Um, and we got them here. You can tell. You know, these are the Okinawan sweet potato tends to be a whiter in flesh, and when you cut into it, um, it's really really purple. All I did was I peeled it, and I diced them into about one inch cubes, just like you would do with a sweet potato. Or if you're making mashed potatoes, so basically the process is you're thinking about the same thing. And now I put it on. I put it on a stove here. I put a little bit of salt, and now I'm simmering it, and I want it to get fork tender. So I'm looking for this fork to go into the potato, and come and and if, as long as the potato gives, it's very tender. Then I'm in good shape. So this is coming together nicely. I'm gonna turn it down and it smells really, really great. I'm actually gonna turn the heat off because I'm, I think it's, I'm happy where it's at. I don't want it to burn any further. Then I'm gonna take the bacon and I'm gonna add it back in. We'll stir that so it can all come together. Now, when we're getting ready to serve this for the, the end of the class, I'll bring it all together. But now you can see, I mean, this is good by itself, right? As is. And this is perfect for, you know, any any day of the week, perfect for, you know, pork, chicken, steak. This is a great all around dish. And again, it's one of those dishes where you can make it, reheat it, it's very sturdy. And I think it's total qualities are 
you know, people say, I don't like Brussels sprouts. I don't, you, you give them this, you'll convert them. All could, right. Could you also do, do the Brussels sprouts in the oven? You could do them in the oven. Um, and for me, like I'm always trying to find fast ways to cook. And I, you know, if I had, let's say, let's say it's Thanksgiving, you get your turkey in the oven, then you, you need to figure something else out, right? So uh, I'm showing you how to do something quick on the stove and think about it, right? If you did it in the oven, you're talking, I don't know, half hour cooking time maybe. And we've just been doing this. It's only been about 10 minutes and we're done. So I think it's, there's a speed, comp speed component that um, you get by doing it on the, on the pan in the stove. Okay, questions about the Okinawan sweet potato. How do you yeah. choose a good Okinawan sweet potato? And then did you cut the potato into chunks or did you slice it? Yeah, so here, you can take a look real quick. I cut it into chunks. So I cut them in half, I cut it in half, then quarters, and then I went through basically and I, I diced them up. Now I'm gonna, I'm draining this. I really wanna try to get as much moisture out as possible because it's gonna impede with, uh, I don't want it to be watery. One thing you can do sometimes when I'm making mashed potatoes, I'll take these, if I have an oven on, I take them, put them on a sheet pan, throw them in the oven to dry them out a little bit. That also helps because I want to, I want to add more flavor to this, right? And I want to make sure that the water doesn't just make them waterlogged. Um, now the question was, how do you pick Okinawan sweet potatoes? Basically what I'm looking for, and like, this is a good one here to show you. I'm looking to see that there's not a lot of dents or blemishes in them, or there's not soft rot spots on there or like, big divots in them. I'm looking for something ideally, for me, I like, I would prefer to find them that are more uniformly like this. This is a sweet potato I have. I'm looking for something like this shape as much as possible because it's easier to peel, right? And I get a better yield versus having to like work around all these odd shaped pieces. Now, there's different arguments. People like this, some people like the smaller ones versus the bigger ones. Um, if I'm looking, if I want to mash them, I want big ones because it's, I don't have to peel as many. But if I'm gonna eat them and slice them, I like small ones because I don't know if it's psychologically, but I take the small ones, I feel like are, they're more tender in my head. Um, they're sweeter in my opinion. So, you know, I think you have to just kind of play with them and see what your personal preferences are. Okay, so we let that sit a little bit and we got my, my mixing bowl here. Now I have a mixing bowl. If you have a, one of those hand mixers that works great. If you don't have one, you get a potato masher that works. Or if you get a, a potato ricer, you know, the one you open up put potatoes and squeeze it. Those all work fine. Um, but this is a fast way that I'm gonna show you guys how to do it. So I'm gonna go ahead and take my potatoes. Uh, go ahead and put it in here. Um, I Sometimes I just go ahead and push it down a little bit to start to break it up. And then I'm gonna go ahead and get on the mixer here. Now I've done versions of this potatoes where, um, you know, you could, if you if you want to try to do a, a, like a healthier version, you can take the potatoes and use this like Greek yogurt or like vanilla Greek yogurt. And so you get that dairy in there without having a lot of, you know, all of that other, like if you're using a, like a non-fat Greek yogurt, you can do something where you're not adding all this fat in there. Right? So I'm going to turn this on right now. We'll let that start to go. Now we're going to make this thing decadent. And the things we're going to add to this are brown sugar, and coconut milk. So I want to throw some brown sugar in here. And again, I'm not you. If you have white sugar, you can use that. But I like brown sugar for this because um, I want that that molasses flavor that's going to be added in there. Okay, that's going in there now. It's looking good. I'm also going to add a little bit of coconut milk and. In this case, I've got some of our Maikai organic. I'm using coconut cream in this instance versus coconut milk. And again, coconut cream, right, has more fat content. So this is, heavy cream is about 32% fat. So I'm using something that's much closer to that. And we'll put some of that in here. A little bit in there. Let that start to mix in. Yoni, another question about Okinawan sweet potato. Can you yeah. tell from the outside if the inside is going to be white or purple? Yeah, that's a good question. Sometimes it's hit and miss for me. Like these happen to be super purple. I was like, wow. But it just, it, it's, yeah, that's, that's tough. One. Don't tell anyone this. Sometimes like I accidentally, when I'm at the store, I might accidentally scrape a little bit of the skin off by accident and then I can tell what's inside. But anyway, so I'm gonna scrape this down. 
You didn't hear that from me. I'm just saying, if like if, if it bumped, if it would happen to bump the side or something. Yeah. This is such an interesting technique to use your KitchenAid. Can you do the same technique to mash white potatoes? Oh, heck yeah. When I was working at the Greenbrier, man, and we were doing mashed potatoes for 600, we would use like an 80 quart mixture and this is how we would do it. I think you have to be careful though when you're doing a whip or whisk like this, or if you're doing potatoes, if you don't cook them enough and if you overdo it, they will get gummy. So. You just have to be careful and you have to watch it to make sure that it doesn't start to get gummy on you. But this is what the potatoes look like. We'll come over here and take a look at it. Now, I figured what the heck, I had some butter lying around for this morning, I'll throw, I'll throw some in. So that's what like, to me, Thanksgiving, right? Is about sugar, butter, bacon, bacon fat, ham, you know, all of the fun things that you don't get to have all the time or Maybe I said I don't get tell all the time. Now, one thing I am gonna add into this a little bit is some salt because I am I wanna season this. I don't wanna be salty, but salt, the salt, just think when you think about uh, a really good chocolate chip cookie, right? It has a little bit of salt in it and it helps bring it out, the flavors out. Now, in this instance, I had a little bit of the potatoes that kind of um on the bottom didn't kind of get mixed it all the way, but so I'm gonna have a little bit of texture in here. There's a little bit, some pieces that I'm breaking up, but I think that's what makes it good. Now, if you wanted to, you could do some, you could do stuff like add some fresh ginger in here. You can start doing things like I've taken um, candy ginger, minced it up very fine and put it in, which makes it a little hints of brightness in there. So I'm gonna taste. Everything we always taste, right? Before I take it out, because if I have to adjust it, then I know, right? And it's tasting good, but I think it needs a little more sugar. And then I would just fold it in. But yeah, this works great for making mashed potatoes. So if it's a little dry, can you add milk? Yeah, I mean, if I, was, if, it, if I thought this was too dry, I would add some more of the coconut milk. But if you have milk, you could add that. You could add more yogurt if you had that. You know what else would be really good to is throw some sour cream in here. So I mean, just think of all the decadent rich things that you can, I mean, if you wanna go for it, you could put some sour cream, a little bit of milk and some coconut milk and then just have the trifecta. Okay, so here we go. We'll put this in here. And again, this totally, I would be like, make the day before. Make the day before. And just, you can reheat it very easily. Okay. Why did you not add the butter and salt while the kitchen aid was going? Uh, you can. Um, I just, I, for me, when I'm cooking lots of times, if I, like, if I was making mashed potatoes, right? I would be adding salt and butter all at the same time when it was going in. In this instance, I happened to come on this side and I needed, I was just gonna finish it. So I, this was a last minute decision. So if I had been more predetermined, I would have done it over there. And the salt I added again, because uh, when I'm cooking, it's always about judgment, right? So in this particular instance, I said, oh, I said, you know what? I gotta put some salt in there and I put it in. So you can totally put it in when you are, um, when you're at your mixer. I just had to put it in. And Butter wasn't on your ingredient list, so how right. much did you that add? That was a, a tablespoon. So that was a. I just happened to have some butter, and I said that I thought it would probably be good, so I just threw it in there. And that's the thing about cooking, right? I'm trying to, there's certain things that you can use your judgment on. Um, when you're reheating this, or you know, if you make it ahead and you're reheating it, yeah. Do you prefer to uh, reheat it in the oven, or is the microwave fine? What's the difference? Microwave is totally fine, and my microwave, microwave is faster. faster. If you're gonna do it in the oven, you know, it's by 30. I would take it out of the fridge for half an hour or so, let it come through the temperature, then cover it foil and put it in the oven. I would not put it in uncovered. Now, the reason why, because I don't want it to, to crust up and, and get too colored. Now, if you want that, if you if you're that's your goal, it's okay. The other thing you can do is if you want to put it in the oven, you can do what I'm gonna show you and then throw it in the oven and it'll toast it, kind of like toasted marshmallows. So this is fluff, right? You could put 
little um the little marshmallows on there if you want or whatever but this is the stuff right here so what you're gonna do so this is a part you can make ahead then you can heat it up the next day and then you start putting this is a the happy action that you put on here okay this is for the kids and it's for the kid in you okay so put some of this on top kind of spreading it out and again, again if you don't, if you don't like this, this you don't have to put it either you know what would be good too is like uh candied macadamia that's be cool on there so i mean there's a lot of different ways you can go about this but i just want to show you this right here now if you're gonna do this like like i said you're gonna heat it up that way then you can take this as is throw that in the oven and then let it brown in the oven kind of like when you're making your casserole save this for the kids later um or you can do the fast method that I want to show you how. If you happen to have one of these, so you take your butane burner and you replicate the whole thing, right? And you just get in there and you make your own torch food marshmallows real quick. Keep in mind, you got to use an oven safe dish. Let's see now you got, you're ready to go. And that was fast. Now, so we have our toasted marshmallows on top of our beautifully coconut sweet potatoes, right? Then I always like texture. So what we're gonna put on here now is a little bit of um, what is we call this senbei, right? It's a ginger wafer cookie. And I'm gonna take some of these. And this, if you haven't had them before, you see this little glaze, this little piece of ginger. So it's a nice. Think of it like a a one, if you think of a fortune cookie type of a cracker with a, a sugar glaze and ginger pieces on it. And then I'm gonna break this on top. And it just adds nice texture. And that's the thing that we think about when I'm cooking. I'm just trying to think about different layers of texture and flavor. So then you have that. So would any other sweet cracker do or? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, if you don't have something like that, I'm trying to think of other things that could you could work. I mean, vanilla wafers could work. I'm thinking of I'm trying to think uh, graham crackers would work. So, I mean, if you if you happen to not be able to get these, those those all I think all work. Shortbread cookie could work. Like I said, any kind of brittle would work. You know, it's all that all that sweet crunchy stuff works. So that this is our one of our sides, and I'm going to bring I'm going to bring together the other dish now. Um, we're going to put, so we, the Brussels sprouts are ready now, right? So I'm going to squeeze some lemon in there. And then we have a uh, fresh thyme. So we'll go back over there and we'll finish, finish this up. So that's what we have so far, right? It's, it's warm. It's looking good. I'm going to put a squeeze of lemon because remember we have all of this, um, we have all of this bacon and bacon fat. And so the, the, the lemon is gonna brighten up the dish and it's gonna bring some nice fresh acidity to here. And now here's my fresh thyme. I'm gonna peel the tiny leaves off like that and sprinkle them in there. So did you have to wait till the dish cooled before you put the lemon and the thyme? No, you could have done it right ahead, but, but I was, uh, I put on the side because I wanted to, it was, I was trying to, sh I had to show you folks how to do the potatoes. I was ready to go. But if you're doing this at home, as soon as that's ready, throw in the lemon, throw in the thyme, and then you're good to go. So I'll bring this back on the other side and we're going to plate this. We'll go ahead and put this in a nice bowl here. And I know you're uh, adding blue cheese. Yes. There. Is there other options for cheese? Yep. Hang on for one second. I was wondering if someone was going to ask because blue cheese is one of those preference things, right? So you love it or you hate it. Okay, so I'll put that there real quick for, for sure. And then um, when I have the blue cheese and what I'm going to put some on here now and then we can, yeah, you can use feta would work. You can use grated Parmesan. You could use any of the nice crumbling cheeses would work. I like blue cheese though. Blue cheese and bacon is a classic pairing flavor wise. And the blue cheese, the, um, you know, the, the, 
the mold that's what makes blue cheese, I think, gives a very specific pungent flavor. And when you think about Brussels sprouts and the caramelization and the rich bacon, the smokiness, you kind of want a cheese that's going to really be able to stand up to all that. So then I'm going to have some extra time. Got some time on my hands. And I'll put a little piece in here. Now, if you want to, again, when you when it's time to, you know, you want to make things look pretty for your guests. So if you wanted to, you could take the, take some lemon. Cut a few slices, put them in here. You know, just kind of add some to it. I think just to kind of dress it up a little bit. So here's two sides that are just like ready to go for Thanksgiving, right? Now, I wanted to show you because these are just these are two simple sides that you can do. I also wanted to take a moment to kind of like bring this all together. And so what I did ahead of time was I roasted a chicken, and I wanted to show that to you. I wanted. To, I thought this would be a good time to talk a little bit about um, carving because you know. That's a question I get asked a lot about and just roasting in general. So, you know, imagine this is Thanksgiving. This is the turkey you can approach in the same way as chicken. Their same structure, just one is bigger than the other, right? And, you know, what I like about this particular bread, you can see that it's very uni it's uniformly big and has a really nice golden color on here. And the thing that I want you guys to all think about when you make your turkey at home is that you should try to get your turkey defrost it in time so you can put it in your refrigerator, uncover it to let it dry. You wanna dry the skin. Like I talked about the whole wet Brussels sprouts and all that water impedes caramelization. So I let this dry out. Now, if you're rushing, you at least get lots of paper towels and dry it as well as you can so that you try to get really good color on it when you roast it, okay? Now, when it comes time to carve, if you're gonna carve this at the table on a big platter, right? The way you typically want to go in here, this is where the breast is, right? The breast, this is where the wishbone is. This is where the breast comes down. You start by taking a cut that goes straight in. Where, this is the wing, right? You cut in where the wing is, all the way to the cavity. And then you would slice down this way. And that's how you get your slices off to serve everyone. So you would cut in and you start slicing down all the way to the top. You cut in slice all the way down that way, okay? Now, that works, but these days, um, you know, I think people like to do things family style or it's simpler, like you, people wanna be able to serve themselves, right? So you don't wanna have to do the whole carving thing. I'll show you uh, the other way to do this so you can be ready to serve this. So you take your, what I typically do is I take off the, uh, you know, if you trust your turkey, take all that off. And then I'm gonna take the legs off first and I'm gonna put it in the platter. So I'll start by, here's come on the side. Here's the drum, right? I'm gonna take it and take my knife and cut into it just so I get to that joint. And then cut it off, put that down here. Cut this off as well. By the way, I roasted this to 165 degrees Fahrenheit when checked in the thickest part of the leg with a thermometer. And please, when you do your turkey, if you've not done this before, get a thermometer and don't rely on the pop-up thing. Those things are very unreliable and they're, they'll pop up when the turkey is definitely cooked, but usually it's when it's overcooked. And that's, you don't want dry turkey, right? The next thing you're gonna do is I wanna take off the thigh. Now I'm gonna cut in here. I'm trying to get down to the bone, the joint again. Popping it out. Can I ask a question about the sweet potatoes? Yeah. If you bake the sweet potatoes, what temperature and how long and would you cover them in foil? Sure. Uh, are we talking if we're baking them for like a casserole or just baking them to like eat like baked sweet potatoes? Oh, for this recipe. Okay. So what I would do Hang on for a second. By the way, some of you might think that this this is a little bit too, you know, this red. I think this is fine. 
but this is personal preference. If you don't like it that way, you got to cook it longer. But I, again, I went to the safe temperature and I'm fine with that. Okay. So then I want to take this thigh off and put it on the plate. Um, if it was a turkey, right, I would, it's a big thigh. So I would take the bone out and slice pieces off that and I would put it on the plate. And then I would, I'm going to put these here. Just, I'm thinking about presentation, right? Um, so now back to the potatoes, what I would do, if I was going to make a casserole, like, well, if I'm baking these potatoes to make a casserole, I'm not going to do something like this. I would still boil the potatoes first because you want to cook them. And then all you're doing is you're going to put all your stuff and you're reheating it and melting everything on top. Um, I find that uh, an Okinawan sweet potato is a dry potato. So the moisture from boiling it helps keep it moist. You know, if you're just going to cut it and put them in, you, you bake it, you might end up kind of with a really dry experience. Plus, then you don't have the benefit of whipping in all the cream and all the butter and all that fun stuff. But you could, you still could do it. But what I would do in this instance is, if I were to bake them, I would probably bake them whole, and I wouldn't wrap them in foil. You can if you want. But what I would do is I would bake them, and this is something I just learned from my wife. She was reading this blog, and she, I usually bake a potato to pork tender, like I talked about. She baked them for like two hours, and they were totally soft, but they were really sweet and rich. So what I would do is I'd leave them in the skin for two hours. She does them, I think, 300 degrees, like low temperature for two hours. And they get really tender and really, really soft. And it's almost similar, like really spoonable texture. But you can cut them open and split them. And then you can put uh, butter, sour cream, brown sugar, candy, ginger in them. So you have a different dish, but it would be really delicious as well. OK. So the next thing you're going to do is you're going to, I want to take off the, the breast. And so you could use, this is a chef knife. At this point, you're better off if you have a smaller knife. It's going to be easier to work with. I'm cutting along the, the breast bone here. I'm trying to follow that breast bone because I want to get as much of the, the flesh off and be in one piece as possible. So here's that one piece right here. And then I'm gonna repeat it. So this, see how much I can, all of that, this, all of the meat is on the piece that I cut off. It's not on the carcass there, okay. Keone, do you usually brine your turkey? I do not. Um, and, and there's a reason for that. Uh, I like crispy skin. And if I brine the turkey, I'm not going to get crispy skin. It'll be like rotisserie chicken. You know, that skin is really thin. And the other reason I don't brine the turkey is the turkeys that, like more conventional turkeys these days, when you buy them, if you read the label, it says brine solution added, like 12%. And essentially, they're already, in my opinion, they're brined. They have, that, they have a salt solution added. So you might not get the benefit of a brine. And if you really want to brine a turkey, and get that benefit of the flavor and the moisture, you might want to get a, you know, we sell natural and organic turkeys. I'd buy one of those that hasn't been uh, treated so that you can really have a good eating experience that way. Okay, so you know how we uh, talked about baking the yes. sweet potato. What about microwaving it? Can, um, what I would do is I would wrap it in sar saran wrap. And then microwave, it takes, it's a little trickier though that way, I think, I mean, hang on, let me just pull this off real quick. I'm gonna just hold this here, cut this off the wing, put that in the platter. But you can microwave it. You just have to go slow until it, it's tender, like pork tender. I usually go like, instead of going like for a long period of time, I'll go a few minutes at a time and check it. I find like, I feel like microwaving works better when I do it in spurts. Okay, so here, and by the way, this is perfect, right? For soup, save that for soup, make stock with that, okay? And all this juice is good for gravy, right? Okay, so then I would take, this is the breast here. And what I wanna do now is, like if I was doing a turkey, I would slice thin, but because it's chicken, I'm gonna slice it a little bit thicker. And again, if you look at this chicken, you see how juicy it is? Look at that. It's because I took, I, I invested in a thermometer and I didn't guess and I really took it out right when it was done. 
at 165 degrees in the thickest part of the leg. Keone, when Sharon made those sweet potatoes yes. that she cooked at 300 degrees for two hours, did she grease the outside of the potatoes? Uh, I don't remember if she oiled them. You can if you want. They'll just they'll, they'll crisp up the skin when you when you when you bake them. Um, it's not necessary though, in my opinion. Okay, so here we have our chicken, right? So now, again, what we like to do when we do when we cook, right? Half of we've talked about this before. Half of the process, half of eating, is visual, right? So you know we want to make a nice presentation. Again, I, I had I already used some lemon, but why not? I'll use I have a piece here, so I'll use a little bit more. Make it look nice. Put that in here. And so now you have a beautifully roasted chicken. We've got our Okinawan sweet mashed potatoes with uh, coconut milk, some butter, and our little toasted marshmallow fluff. And then we have our bacon or our caramelized Brussels sprouts with bacon and blue cheese. And there we have it. Are, we, are there any mm. questions? Any last minute questions? Yes, yes. So where do you put the thermometer in the bird, in the uh, turkey? And do you use the oven's automatic sensor feature? Okay, so shoot, you know where, you know where, the, where the, the drumstick and the thigh come together when they, when they stick out? I take my thermometer and I look for that fleshiest piece of, piece of the thigh and I put my thermometer right in there. And I don't, you don't want the thermometer to hit the bone because you get a, a false read. It needs to be in the fleshiest part of the thigh. I mean, my great grandma would call it the uha. Get it right in that fleshy part of the uha, and then you you want it to be. You wait for 165. That's what you're looking for. Um, what was the other question, Cheryl? There was another question about right. Okay, so I. And by the way, here's, a, here's, a, here's something you might want to think about doing too, is I don't even use my oven anymore. I, I do the turkey now and I did this, I had it a whole, I was holding in the oven. I roasted this on my, my gas grill outside. And here's the reason why. I turn my gas grill super hot, put it on, close the lid and it becomes a nice oven, right? And the heat in there quickly sears the outside of the chicken or the turkey. And then as soon as I get that golden color, I turn it down to low and it roasts outside. And inside my, in, in, in the house here, it's not hot. I don't have smoke, I don't have grease in my oven. So, you know, if you have access, if you have a gas grill, you might want to consider trying that. So I take a, a sheet pan, I wrap it with, with aluminum foil. Then I put my chicken or my turkey on that. And it, it roasts quicker um, and it browns even, even nicer. But if you have those features in your oven, the instant thing, um, you can try it. I mean, if you're talking about the, the, the probe, right? Where you stick it in the turkey, then you put it in the oven. Um, that can work. The key is using a scientific methodology for checking the doneness, right? So whatever tool you're going to use, make sure that it's accurate, it's calibrated, and you're using it to go into the thickest, the fleshiest part of the thigh and not hit the bone. All right. Were there any other questions? Yes. Yeah. So if you don't have that fancy torch that you used, how would mm -hmm. you brown the... Yeah, the sorry. Box? So what you want to do is turn your... If you don't have the torch... Um, Turn your oven on the broiler setting. So you, you put, put your marshmallows on, put it right underneath the broiler and then hold it there. And that heat from the broiler will lightly toast, toast the marshmallows. And then as John is enjoying his Basil Hayden's whiskey while watching the show, he wants to know what is a good beverage pairing for this dish? Wow. I'm just thinking about the Basil Hayden right now. Um, by the way, John, if you're on, if you're in if you're here on in Hawaii, you should try Old Tub. We have that at our field wine company. It's this really Marvin, our our spirits and wine guy, brought this stuff in. I think it's like twenty bucks, but it's amazing. And we don't have a lot of it left. So if you want some, you probably want to go get twelve bottles because if you like Basil Hayden, this is your pretty smooth stuff. Um, sorry, sidetrack. The the things that I would recommend drinking for for this and for Thanksgiving, right? So you. If we're talking about wine, uh, the, the, the per, one of the perfect wines for this kind of food is Pinot Noir. So the Pinot Noir, great. So red burgundy, 
or as we call it, like varietally labeled in the United States would be a Pinot Noir. I think Willamette Valley makes great Pinot Noir. Sonoma County, California makes great Pinot Noir. Um, you know, if you, outside of uh, Europe, I mean, you could get some great Pinot Noir is it from New Zealand. You want a nice kind of a cold, crisp climate, but it works well because it's high acid, it's bright, it has cranberry essence, tartness. I think it goes really well with all of these kinds of foods. And turkey is a lighter flesh, right? So it, it, it doesn't overpower it. Um, another uh, Chardonnay would be really good. I would, I would recommend something that has more neutral oak, which means not something that's got a, like really, really powerful, like a Napa Chardonnay, some of those are a little bit too oaky. Um, but I think Chardonnay would be good. You probably can get away with uh, a, Sauvignon, a Sauvignon Blanc, something from, from like California, which is a little bit more weighty. Um, and then, you know, talking about beers, I think um, ales, I think IPAs, you gotta be careful if, if it's too bitter, it might throw it off, but um, a nice lager, I think would be great. Um, and since you brought it up, man, I would, you know, Manhattan always works great or an old fashioned too. So um, those are my recommend recommendations. And I think um, any of those would go well with the food we have here. Okay, and the final question, Lynette yes. wants to um, ask, wants to know if you can share a little bit about our new Kahala store and the restaurant. Ooh, yeah. So I was just here this morning too. It's coming together really nicely. Um, you know, it's called Kahala Market by Foodland and we did it for special, for specific reasons. The selection is really, um, it's a little bit different than from a regular Foodland Farms or regular Foodland. We've really curated a tight selection. It's a smaller store, um, a lot of natural, a lot of gourmet. Um, produce is going to be great. We have this really huge wall of grab and go. We have meal kits. We're going to have uh, ready to heat meals. We're going to have wraps, salads, power bowls, grain bowls. Um, we're going to have this really cool hot counter where you can come and pick a main and two sides. We're doing like salmon and roast chicken. Um, we have this really nice pizza counter where we're doing 12 inch pizzas. And we'll sell them by the whole and the half. And we'll have daily specials. Well, of course, we have the poke that you folks all love. Um, our field wine company will be in there with a really amazing wine selection. Marvin's done a really great job. They'll have the small room with a little, we call it our little wine vault where you can go in there and if you want to treat yourself to a really nice bottle. Um, we'll have some selections in there. And then the restaurant we're adding on there is going to be, well, in, in normal times, it's about a 65 seat restaurant. Um, the restaurant is called Et Al, which means and others. And we're excited about the name because the, the, the restaurant is sort of an addendum to the store and um, and others means really you and your guests, you and your family. So we wanna make sure you and your groups of people come and the food, we call it new American, new uh, American regional. Um, so we're featuring local products and a, a myriad of different cooking styles, but local products. And there'll be you know references to our different melting pot culture as well. Uh, the dining room staff is great. The chef is amazing um, and the store opens on November 18th. So two weeks from now, it'll be, it'll be interesting. I'm gonna go there, open the store, then I'm gonna rush home so we can do, I think we're gonna do stuffing and cranberry sauce on the 18th when we come back here together. But store is looking great. We're all ready to go. Don't forget, if you gotta come on opening day, open table, right? On open table, you can make reservations to come and pick a slot to come and visit the store. Um, so we, we want to, we want to, we want everyone to come and enjoy and check out the new store, but of course we want to do it safely. So, um, we'll do open table for, I think a week, right? Uh, through Sunday. Through, okay. Through Sunday. So Wednesday through Sunday, open table, and then you guys can just, it's open to come to the public, uh, without reservation. So looking forward to the store opening and I think you guys will all really enjoy it. We're looking forward to providing something for the community. And I think it's going to be really fun. And with that, um, when you guys make this, send me your pictures. If this is part of your Thanksgiving spread, send me those pictures. We're looking forward to it. But after next week, after next class, we'll have, you have a potato dish, a vegetable dish, you have a cranberry sauce, you'll have a stuffing. And well, I showed you how to do a turkey with the chicken. So we'll see you next time. Good night, everyone. <laughs>